Well, welcome everyone. Uh, today is day three of the National Wilderness Skill Institute for this particular class. Let's get going. So once again, I'm Dave Alberl. I'm from the Green Mountain and Finger Lakes National Forests. I'm the SAW coordinator here. Uh, I've been in this role now for about five years and uh, I feel very honored to be talking with you guys today and hoping that we can uh, show you a whole bunch of really fascinating stuff when it comes to crosscut saws. Uh, for our, my presentation today, I've relied heavily on the Arthur Carhart Wilderness Training Institute. Uh, they've furnished uh, many of the photos that you'll see today, and I greatly appreciate uh, their cooperation. Uh, it's Mr. Dan Abbey. So today is the introduction to crosscut saw use and maintenance. Objectives for today, we're going to explore crosscut saw anatomy, identify saw types, grinds, teeth, tooth patterns, and handles for effective use. We're going to learn basic safe handling and transportation practices. We want to identify the role of the axe and other tool aids. Explore operational use, i.e. you and the saw. And then learn how to inspect, care, and maintain your saw. So jump straight into crosscut saw anatomy. Here's the crosscut saw. So the main body of the saw is called the blade. It's the, the large, broad hunk of metal that makes up the majority of the, uh, of the tool. The bottom of that consists of the teeth. And the teeth are mounted along a circle or arc of the saw. Uh, for our large crosscut saws, that's a convex arc. And for our small pruning saws, that can be a little concave arc. And those uses are, uh, you know, those designs uh, work to your advantage. Um, and then on the sides there, you'll see that there's a handle, several different types of handles. And we'll talk about those in more depth now. First of all, saw types, there's one person or two person saws. And then within one or two person saws, you've got felling, bucking, or pruning. So the felling saw has a you know, concave shape etched out of the back of the saw. Uh, this particular saw makes room for wedges whenever you need to use a wedge, uh, especially quickly. The bucking saw, on the other hand, has a straight backside to it. And that is to facilitate a little bit extra weight to the blade of the saw so that you can more effectively cut by yourself. It also helps uh, whenever you're pushing because that saw is much thicker. And then also you'll see on the felling saw, there's only one, hand, one handle hole at the end of the saws. And then on the bucking saw, there's two. And once again, that's to facilitate a little bit easier handle placement. Uh, for bucking operations. Here's an example of a one-person saw. One-person saws are generally used only for bucking. Uh, and they typically have that D handle, that wooden D handle you see in the back there. Occasionally you've got the uh, accessory handle mounted on top or it's mounted here at the other end of the saw for your saw partner. This is a two-person bucking saw. You can see it's got a, uh, a pin handle on either end. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. And then finally, the pruning saw. Pruning saws are a very handy extra uh, tool to have with you. OK, so next, let's talk about grinds. Uh, the grind of the saw really aids depending on what your situation is. Uh, so the ones I'm going to show you today, these are just a, a few of what's out there. But we'll show you the flat ground, the straight tapered grind, and the crescent tapered ground. So for the flat ground saw, you can see the end blade view looking into the curve and it, the saw is cut from one solid sheet of metal and there's nothing additionally done to the, the main body of the, of the blade. 
looking from the top, you can see that once again, it's, it's thick all the way through. And what this means for you as a sawyer is that those teeth have to be set further apart to make room for the saw to enter the wood. Uh, so the, the curve on these saws is typically a little bit wider and that can make them a little bit tougher to use. For a straight taper ground saw, you see that the top, top of the blade is once again even all along, but then there is a taper that runs from the, the top down to the teeth. And that facilitates a little bit of extra wiggle room in the kerf of the saw and makes it much easier for you as a sawyer to pull that saw back and forth through, the, through your cut. One thing to note there is that the, the teeth are larger in the middle of the blade. And the crescent tapered ground saw. Uh, this is kind of your Cadillac of uh, saws in this, in this class. So uh, you can see saw blade end view, tapers from top to bottom, top to the teeth. And then along the top of the saw, you can see it gets thicker towards the ends where the handles uh, made up to the saw. And then the back of the saw is, is slightly concave, uh, especially towards the middle. But the, the teeth are of uniform thickness all along the, the length of the blade. Uh, these are typically your, your really nice felling saws. Okay. So those three types of grinds, let's talk about uh, what type of teeth you may encounter for your, your particular saw. So we've got cutter teeth. These are the, the teeth that actually physically sever the fiber. And they usually work in tandem. So those two teeth that you see there actually oppose one another. You get a raker tooth. So once the cutter teeth go through the wood and score the fibers, and actually physically cut the fiber length, then the raker tooth comes from the side and lifts those cut fibers away from the curve. And then you've got combination teeth. And combination teeth uh, do both what the cutter and the raker uh, perform, uh, kind of all in one, one fell swoop. The thing about combination teeth, though, is that they are harder to use. Uh, they, they do bite more aggressively, and they'll wear you out faster. Okay, so now the tooth patterns. Once again, there are many tooth patterns out here. These are just a sampling of what's out there. Uh, and by and large, these are the most common. So you've got the plain tooth. This was the original uh, style of tooth that showed up way back in the... Uh, 15th century. Uh, if you see these today, typically they're small, they're small pruning saws. Uh, or if you find a great big one in a yard sale somewhere, it's probably a nice saw. M tooth. This is a very aggressive form of saw tooth pattern. It, uh, it bites extremely hard. And for that reason, it's typically only used in racing. However, it does have some application whenever you're working with hardwoods. The champion tooth. Uh, this particular pattern is really nice for working in hardwoods. Uh, the ends of those teeth, because it comes to such a broad point, actually withstands uh, a lot more abuse than some of the other tooth patterns. And on top of that, it's much easier on the filer at the end of the day to sharpen that saw as opposed to some of the others you'll see. Then there's the Great American Tooth. And one thing you'll notice about that is now the space between the cutters is getting smaller in, uh, in some regard. Uh, the Great American Tooth is a, is a really effective pattern for uh, making a compound cut. So you're, you're not cutting directly across the fiber grain. Uh, you're actually cutting slightly along the length of the fiber a little bit. The Great American Tooth pattern does very well with that particular scenario. Next, we've got the lance tooth. The uh, lance tooth pattern is very good in softwood. Uh, it's probably one of the fastest cutting teeth types or tooth patterns that's made. Uh, it 
It doesn't hold up real well in hardwood though. And then you've got kind of a compromise. Uh, this is the perforated lance. Like I said before, those perforations tie two separate teeth together and those two separate teeth oppose each other. So it's a little bit harder for those teeth to bend out of shape if you're cutting something that's a little bit harder. So with a little bit more detail here, you can see now those, those cutting surfaces um, on the cutters themselves. And then you can see the raker depth kind of in the center of your screen. And that's a really critical uh, component of a crosscut sawtooth pattern. You really want that raker depth to be consistent across the length of the saw. And the reason for that is because as the cutters come through the wood, they score the fiber and wood is slightly springy. So as it goes through, you want to make sure that the, the raker is set slightly lower so that whenever that wood springs back out again, the raker can remove what's been severed uh, without grabbing a fiber that hasn't been cut yet. And then on the far, on the far right hand side of your screen there, you can see the, the tooth set. And the set varies depending on what the saw grind is. Uh, once again, with the flat ground surface, the tooth set has to be a little bit wider, uh, which makes it harder on you as the sawyer to pull that saw through the wood. Uh, but then on the, on the crescent ground grind or the, uh, the taper grind, uh, you can get by with a little bit less tooth set. And once again, that also varies by the size of the saw and the, the thickness or the gauge that the saw was made from. So here you can see the, the actual functional arrangement of the teeth. The, the cutters move through the wood fiber and they're once again cutting the length of the fiber. And then the raker comes through and peels the cut fibers up. The gullet there is then, uh, depending on the size of the gullet, uh, removes those, those cut lengths of fiber and we call those noodles and takes them fully out of the tree and onto the ground uh, so that the, the rest of the saw can continue cutting. Okay, so now let's talk about handles for a little bit. Hey, Dave, hey Dave, this is Pete. Can you, uh, Pete. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can yeah. you um, uh, expound on the gullet and the length of the saw and how it exp you expel the noodles? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Pete. So the gullet, depending on the length of the saw, you need a larger gullet for a longer saw. Um, as the saw moves through a larger piece of material, the noodle gets longer. And if your gull is not quite big enough, then the, the noodle piles up inside there and obstructs the ability of the saw to cut through the wood. So if, if your saw is designed for cutting some really large material, those gullets will be very deep. Uh, however, if the gullets are shallow, then it's designed much more for smaller diameter pieces of material. Uh, so you take that back again and you can look at a plain tooth and you realize that a plain tooth is once again most effective for very small diameter pieces. We can talk about a couple of those others real quick. You can see the Great American then is a good compromise between um, having gullets, but then also having small, uh, small tooth uh, distances. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, Pete. The handles. So first is a loop handle here. The loop handle is a very easy use, uh, easy handle to use. Uh, it attaches by just simply looping, this, placing this loop, this metal loop over the end of the saw, and then twisting the handle itself to tighten the loop against the saw. Uh, problem with the loop handle is that they aren't very versatile. So what you see is what you get. Yeah, that is the only orientation you can use that handle in. 
And because of that, you do have to be careful. Whenever you're pushing from the top of that handle, the, it changes the angle that you're impacting wood fiber uh, from the uh, perspective of the force you're putting into those teeth. If your hand is right along the, the teeth themselves at the base of the saw, uh, the force is directed directly across the teeth. But as you move your hands further up and away from the teeth, you're pushing more down on the teeth. And that'll make the saw bite much harder. Uh, so you really have to watch your pressure, uh, especially if your saw is nice and sharp uh, with this type of handle. This is a pin handle and it does exactly that. It attaches by sliding a pin through a hole in the blade and then you twist the wing nut on the back side of the handle to tighten the, the whole assembly up against the blade of the saw. It's slightly more complicated, uh, but they're extremely, extremely versatile. And uh, like I've written there, you'd wanna be careful not to over tighten these. Uh, over time, that pin it goes through the saw will wear out and uh, you'll have to replace it at some point. And the best thing I found for that is a uh, trick a friend of mine told me he can get the uh, really hard stainless steel rivets. Uh, if you can't find them at your local hardware store, you can certainly order them online. Make sure you get the right size, uh, but they make a really good replacement for those little pins. And I'll talk a little bit more about the versatility too before I leave this. You can see the notches uh, right here. Uh, they're inscribed into the handle. And what that allows you to do, there's a couple ridges that are molded on the back of the, the handle guard. And this allows you to turn the handle 90 degrees or 180 degrees in orientation to your teeth. Uh, and that facilitates the ability to cut either low next to the ground or like the loop handle, you can push uh, hard with a much higher angle down onto the teeth if you need more, more bite. And then finally, we've got the D handle here. Hey Dave, oh, just, just, just in a moment forward. with the pin, with the pin handles, the question is which hole should you use? It's a yeah. So as I was describing with the loop handle there, so the the two the two holes here uh, allow you to change that that force that you're putting into the saw. So if you're if you put the handle on the lower hole next to the teeth, uh, you're driving the force more across those teeth, and that allows the saw to grab less. Uh, however, if you move up to the the higher hole setting, you're going to push more down onto the teeth of the saw. And, and so the saw is going to try to bite harder. Um, and you can use that to your advantage depending on, you know, the size of the material that you're working with, or, uh, or maybe if you need to, uh, to cut in a, in a kind of an awkward situation. So, so you could use that upper hole potentially, like also if you're working on some really soft woods, um, absolutely. Where a little extra bite isn't going to hurt you and it's going to move more material for you. So gotcha. thanks. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so here's your D handle again. A yeah, single person saw is not easily removable, uh, but it is somewhat versatile. He can he can grab a hold of either the the top of the handle here if you need to cut vertically with the saw, uh, or you know, depending on the size of a uh, maybe your your limbing, uh, you can turn the saw on its side and, and do some limbing with it too. Uh, primarily though, it's designed for bucking, one man bucking. Okay, and then we've got the supplementary handle. Uh, this attaches by inserting a pin or a hook through the blade, and then you twist the handle to tighten, just like the loop, uh, with the exception that there's a pin. Uh, so it's only used on one person saws. It can be used by a solo operator and right next to your D handle, or it can be added at the end of your saw, like it's shown here, uh, for your saw partner. Help you out in larger, larger bucking situations. Okay, so let's run through a quick exercise. I'm gonna tell you that you've got a wind event. It's recently impacted a two mile section of wilderness trail beginning at a trailhead access. 
So you don't have to hike very far. Uh, the initial report indicates that there's uh, several small pines and a couple of big oak trees obstructing the trail. A big tree will very likely be less than 2.5 feet in diameter for this section of trail. Uh, and then also you will have an experienced sorter you trust and have worked with before in your saw team. The questions that I want you to answer, just go ahead and type your question answers into the, uh, the chat there. Uh, what type of saws would you bring and how many? And then what saw tooth patterns would you choose if you had access to any saws of your choice? Once again, I'll go back. I'll let you read that again. So what types of saws would you bring and or how many? And then what saw tooth patterns would you choose if you had access to any saws of your choice? So you've got some softwood, and then you've got a couple of big oak trees. And we'll give you a couple minutes to think about that. Yeah, it looks like there's some, some answers starting to trickle in here. I'm not able to see what they're writing, Bill, if you can fill me in on that. Sure, yeah. Uh, we've got one, Christopher says, one person bucking saw and a pruning saw with plain tooth, perforated lance or champion on the bucking saw. Uh, Chaco says pruning saw and a two-man champion tooth pattern. Um, champion tooth and lance tooth. Crescent tapered saw with lance teeth. We most likely bring a perforated lance two-man saw and a smaller pruning saw. Uh, Five-foot bucking champion teeth with a D-handle pruning saw. Um, and you all got a lot more saws in your cache than I do. Um, <laughs> I, I would, wait, 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 we're getting specific here with Nick. I would take a Simon's five foot 324 lance tooth with a 10 to 11,000 set raker, uh, set and raker, um, two person cross cut combination perforated and pruning saw. <laughs> Very nice. Nick. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's several ways you could approach this. Uh, Typically, you, you would want something like a perforated lance or a champion tooth pattern to handle that, that harder wood. And then, yeah, it sounds like everybody's catching on to the, uh, the pruning saw. Uh, it's a very, very helpful tool that you can get through those small pines with. Uh, saves you some time. And then together, you guys can work on the uh, larger, the larger trees. And yeah, you can bring potentially two one-man saws. And you, you and your saw partner can work independently. Uh, or you could work together in tandem, uh, depending on what you think is appropriate for you. Very good. Okay. Next, let's talk about handling and transportation. Safe handling. You want to make sure that you're using gloves whenever you're working around exposed teeth. Uh, these teeth are very sharp. And it's very, very easy to cut yourself. Uh, whenever you're trying to, to either put the sheath on or take it off. Additionally, you really want to make sure you're communicating clearly with fellow, sawyer, fellow sawyers in your area. Uh, whenever you're going to pull off a saw sheath, you want to make sure that they're aware that you're doing that. And then also whenever you're, uh, you're moving the saw around, especially if you're going to pass it to somebody, you want to make sure that you make, make contact with that person and say, hey, you know, are you ready, ready to take the handle of this saw or do you want this saw? And whenever you offer it to them, make sure that they say, got it. And, and they get a firm grasp on that saw before you let go. And the reason for that is because uh, a well-maintained saw has oil on it. And so those blades are pretty slippery. 
whenever you're passing that saw, you want to make sure that the teeth are pointed up and that they put their hands underneath the, the bottom of the blade. And then if the saw is small enough, you can wrap your fingers through the gullets to make sure you've got a good firm grasp on the saw before you, before you take control. And for transportation purposes, uh, most of us have either experience with uh, packing it in on foot or on a pack mule uh, or in a vehicle. Uh, for foot transportation, you want to make sure that you carry the saw on your shoulder. And if you, if you are the person carrying the saw, you want to be at the back of the line. If there's more than one person, you want to take off one handle. You want to take off the handle that's, that's furthest away from you. And then you want to place the saw on your shoulder with the teeth pointed away from your neck. Uh, this is the safest way to carry the saw. And then by re removing that handle, it reduces the amount of stress on that blade as you're walking through the woods. It also reduces the chance that you're going to grab something with that handle and pull yourself off your feet. Uh, for a pack mule, uh, you can either bend the saw over the top of a bag or some of the cargo the mule is carrying. Uh, and if you do that, you want to make sure that the, te the teeth are pointed to the rear. Uh, the other way that I like to, to do this, which is I'm much more favorable of, is putting it between two pieces of plywood like you see there in the back of the truck and then mounting that on the side of the mule. Um, and I like that more because if you do have a long pack and you don't have to worry about the saw being, uh, being bent uh, for a long period of time. Uh, but whenever you do that, you want to make sure that you're attaching that saw to one of the most docile mules in the train. And, and that you put that mule up in the front uh, so that you can keep a really close eye on it. Uh, should it become hung or it gets panicked, uh, you want to make sure to calm it down quickly so the saw doesn't get hung up. For a vehicle, uh, in the bed like this is uh, the best and, and most common way to transport a crosscut saw. And depending on how far you're going, uh, you can either use just a regular hose sheath, as you see on the top, or you can put it you know, once again in between two pieces of oiled plywood. Uh, for the other things listed there, the, the plane or the boat, uh, you want to make sure that you make contact with the uh, either the captain or the pilot. Uh, and if they've got any personnel that are supporting uh, their efforts to, to transport you, uh, contact them and make sure that you know what the protocol is for that particular uh, boat or plane. Uh, and then if you're in a boat, especially if you're anywhere near salt water. As soon as you arrive at your destination, you get off the boat again, you want to make sure that you take your saw out of the sheath and give it a good wipe down because uh, salt water is terrible <laughs> for your grass cut saw. Okay, let's talk about the axe a little bit and some other tool aids. Uh, the axe, this is probably the most indispensable crosscut saw companion. You can get a whole bunch of different types of bits uh, and various grinds associated with those, those bits, uh, but they usually come in either a single or a double fit configuration. Uh, and then the uses for these include a whole load of things, but the most common are limbing, uh, barking your, your tree that you're gonna work in, uh, driving wedges, especially with a single bit, and then uh, underbucking and undercutting, so opening up a face. Uh, should you need to control a log through a, 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 large, a large range of motion, uh, the axe is very good at opening up that face for you. And on the underbucking piece, uh, you can drive the axe head solidly into a log, and then you can support your crosscut saw on the handle of that axe uh, while you work on the underside of the log. Uh, this takes some practice. It's, it's very good. First couple times you go out with a mentor that uh, you, you get them to show you this, this process. It's, it's awkward. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what makes it so awkward and how to, how to handle that here in a minute. Wedges. So we talked a little bit about wedges yesterday. Uh, you see on the right, we've got the, the hard plastic variety. Uh, there's some metal, metal in the background there. 
And then on the left, we've got uh, more metal wedges, and then we've got the, the hanging wedges, which you can see are tied together. And we'll show you a video here in a minute that uh, demonstrates how to use all of these uh, very well, I think. And we'll address any questions from you about the wedging for process after that video. Uh, so on the right, you can see the ax being used as an underbug. Uh, once again, the, uh, that takes some practice to set that up because you, you can only swing the ax once <laughs> to, to get that set deep enough to support your saw. You're more than welcome to keep trying. Uh, and please do, but it only you only get really you got to drive it deep with one swing, and then the handle has to end up exactly where you need it. So that takes practice. The the underbuck on the left is a mechanical underbuck. There's actually two separate varieties there. You can see uh, the little clamp variety that actually goes on your axe handle, and that uh, preserves your your axe handle a little bit better uh, with a little pulley that's mounted on that. And then the other one is the uh, mechanical, the fully mechanical variety. And you drive that into the side of the log um, at a slight angle up from the ground. And then with the, the lever that's mounted on the side of this, uh, you can control how close or far you want your pulley to be from the material you're cutting with or you're, that you're cutting on. And so as you cut deeper, this gives you the ability to slide closer to the material uh, to maintain the same amount of pressure uh, as you make your underbuck. Uh, the trick with the underbuck, whenever you're using the saw, is that you have to drop your hands. Instead of lifting up at the end of your stroke, uh, you actually have to drop your hands at the end of the stroke to maintain contact with the piece that you're cutting on. And this is a, a lot easier to to show in the field than it is online. Uh, but just keep that in mind because the, the circle of the saw is then inverted. And so you, you've got to work with that inverted circle. It's, it's not the easiest thing to learn. Well, and then finally, digging tools. You know, there's a whole bunch of different varieties of things out there. Uh, just an old, regular old Forester shovel is a great thing to have. Uh, you've got the combinations of the combi tools. Uh, you see the, the fire folks out uh, usually have these on their engines or on their crews. And it allows you to, to do multiple things, but it's really nice because it's kind of a small shovel with a long handle on it. And you can reach underneath a large piece of material and dig out an effective channel to, to either place a runner if you need some, which is a, a cut piece of material to support the log that you're working in, um, or to give yourself some space for the uh, the saw to pass through your cut as you complete your cutting sequence. Uh, the matic there is like a, it's a large hoe and you can either have a pick on one end or a uh, chopping bit on the other side. And then of course the flask. Okay, so operational use. So as Bill was talking about yesterday, you know, we've got, uh, many different types of binds that you can encounter while you're doing your, your cross-cut use. And here are the, the main types of cuts, as you saw yesterday, that to address those different types of binds. And they follow either, you know, you can buck one person or two person. And there's the under bucking sequence, uh, there's the wedging, and then there's limbing and, and, limbing and brushing, excuse me. So we're about to watch a video. And for this video, I want you guys to start thinking about these questions. How often do the Sawyers in this video communicate with each other? Uh, what information are they relaying? How do they begin their cuts? What ergonomic strategies are the Sawyers using? And what wedging strategies do they use for their scenarios? Uh, so we've got two, two videos. Uh, the first one is a single a single bucking situation. And then the next one is a, a tandem bucking situation with two Sawyers. I also want to let you guys know too that uh, before you really start cutting in tandem, uh, you know, paired on either end of a saw, you really should practice on your own with a uh, either a, a two-man bucking saw 
or a, a one handled uh, one person saw. And, and the reason for that is because you, you, grow, you grow much more familiar with how the, the saw behaves whenever you're cutting alone than you do whenever you're cutting with someone else. And so then whenever you do start cutting with someone else, uh, your technique is refined, your form is efficient, and you don't bind the saw in the curve as you make your cut. So with that, here is the Missoula Technology and Development Center, and this is the Crosscut Sawyer. Removing bark will help keep the saw sharp. So what I'm going to do is to center my saw exactly where I want it to be. I want it to be in a nice straight up and down plane. I'm just going to guide it. And then I want to try and use all of the blade that I can. It's a waste of energy just to be using a little piece in the center. And sometimes it's a little bit harder to see from the side if the saw is perfectly vertical, but you're a lot better off to be sawing from the side because you can use a good rocking motion from the hips. This is a beautiful cutting saw. You can see really nice chips coming out with it. The objective of this is just to have a, a slow, easy rhythm. Um, we're not killing snakes. I'm going to keep lubricating this as I go along just because I can feel the pitch in this tree. This is one of those saws that all you have to do is sort of put it in the kerf and it does the sawing. Now, the next video. This is a tandem sawing situation. And for this particular situation, what they're working with is a, is a top bind as well as a side bind. So they've got two separate binds going on in this tree. And you'll notice that they, they have to adjust their their cutting plan accordingly. So share this full screen. And for those of you that haven't seen this video before, I highly recommend watching the whole thing um, on your own. No, uh, this is called the Crosscut Sawyer, and it's available on YouTube. I think we're ready to start sawing then. Sounds like it to me. Yeah. You want to get on that side? You're the tall guy. <laughs> Everything's relative, right? I'm clear of knots underneath here. Okay, there are no knots under here. So what would your choice be? Maybe like 15 degrees off if you could get away with it? Yeah. But you know, since it's going to drop so far, I'd go on and cut this straight and put our angle in the other side. And this is going to drop okay. enough it shouldn't cause us any trouble. Let's do a little air saw to get it started. Oops. Looks like you're pulling straight. How do I look? Looks good. Good. You want a little lube? That sounds good. And I usually just lube it right in the cut. And do we want to be taking as long a stroke as possible? We sure do. I want to use the whole saw. I like standing beside the saw and pulling it across the front of my body. If you stand behind it, you can't use your legs. Looks like we can get a wedge started. Okay. And so why do you put the first one in the, in the very center in the top? Well, I've got the most clearance from the saw that way and the most leverage to hold the kerf open. But once we get a little farther in, I'm going to put them at 10 and 2 o'clock just in case the side bind wants to move the log this way or that and pinch the saw. 
Sounds good. Good. My way. I'm hearing a little creaking. I'm hearing a little creaking too. You always got to watch that curve and keep your ears open. Well, let's go on and tighten that wedge and put in a couple more. I have the saw. All right. I'd sure hate to pinch it. That takes the fun out of the day. Well, it looks like we've got a little side bind because the kerf's opening up. I didn't expect that, but that's what you learn as you watch the kerf while you're cutting. I'm going to put in these hanging wedges to try to hold things a little bit still while we cut. Is your kerf opening up too, or is yes, it just it is. pushing this way? It no, is. No, okay. mine's opening up also. All right. What we'll want to watch is make sure there's not a lot of movement and decide which one of us should get out of the way so the other can finish the cut. Almost looks like your kerf might be a little bit wider than mine. You know, that's what I'd expect, yep. that tree pushing it this way. You know, I'm going to let you finish this one. I don't really want to stand here with this side bind popping this thing towards me. And I feel comfortable here because if anything, this end is going to swing out towards you and this end's going to be steady. Okay. Saw is yours. Golly, how much of my how much of the saw is coming through? About 18 inches. It's really cracking and opening up, but those hanging wedges you put in are really keeping it from rotating. Well good. Sometimes when I don't have them, I'll just swing an axe and set the blade across the curve. so we can roll this piece out of the way downhill. Okay. But I want it to be able to roll freely that direction and I want it to be able to drop out. So we'll have to cut a compound angle. Okay. Let's put the saw across and line up that compound angle. Now this would be straight across. Okay. So first let's orient our angle this way. Okay. About like that. And then the second angle we're looking for is this way. So we'll tilt it like that. It's unnatural to hold the handles of a saw angled like that, but we'll just have to remember to do it. Okay. You know, I always put in a wedge for good luck. starting to open. I think I should probably finish it. Probably got about seven inches on my side. I'm gonna stop for just one sec. Oh, hey, thanks. if we can pivot this a little bit and roll it down the hill. Make sure no one is down below and shout out a warning before the log rolls. In some Ooh. cases, you might use a stump as a pivot point to redirect the cut section off a trail. <laughs> All right. Let's go back and look at those questions again. You guys can start uh, putting answers in the chat. But how often do the sawyers communicate with each other? I think it's fairly frequent or are they being pretty quiet? Yeah, frequently they're they're you know, frequently frequently they're communicating all the time before, during, after. 
Yeah, constant exactly. communication. That's what we're hearing. Exactly. So. Yep. And that's exactly what I wanted you guys to, to take out of that. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are yeah, lots of good comments in the chat. It's continuing rela uh, relaying cutting conditions as they happen. You know, they were talking about the curve, um, barking and air sawing uh, first um, to get a get a rhythm going and, and to get any debris that may dull the saw off the wood. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of good comments. I talked about hearing and what I referenced yesterday. The good thing about a cross cut over a chainsaw is you can hear the fibers talking to you. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So Kim's got a question. Um, in a pinch, literally, we once used hanging wedges like regular wedge because we ran out of plastic wedges. Is that acceptable? It's not ideal. Um, if you're being very, very, very careful. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but in a pinch. You know, you they also you don't have much, I would also add, they don't have much of an angle. So they, it's not like they're gonna do a great job of keeping, you know, by design, they're a sharper angle, if you will, yeah. smaller angle. Mm -hmm. um, where, you, where you really wanna be careful with that is if, if the saw is gonna fall a long way after the cut's made, uh, and you, you really wanna be careful about, you know, maybe there's a different option instead of, uh, instead of making a straight cut, maybe you can make an offset cut. And then that way your saw is out of the way if that's the only type of wedge that you have available to you uh, so that you're, you're keeping the saw safe. Um, but provided, you know, that's not, that's not always the, what you have available to you in certain situations, but that's something I would look at doing. Yeah, and, and, and I'd, I'd add to sometimes using what I call a following wedge or just something, it, your kerf may open up dramatically to where it can't even hold a wedge anymore. But when that, when that piece, when the buck falls out, depending on the angles, it, the top of the buck can then meet the bottom of the buck on the other piece and grab your saw at the very bottom of your kerf um, as yeah. the buck falls away. And sometimes having a, what I call following following wedge uh, Lee does have a question about what is a hanging wedge, and we haven't really specifically described that yet. Yeah, so the, the hanging wedge is the uh, those, those two metal wedges that were tied together, and and they're and they're called that because after the cut's made, if you um, if you drive an axe or if you place the rope like they did up on top of the log, uh, the wedges will remain up on top of the piece that's going to stay put. Uh, so that you don't have to go chasing your wedges down the hill. Or at least that's how it was explained to me. Um, I think some other folks have told me in the past that they call them that because you can hang them around your neck you know, to make it easier to transport. Uh, but that's that's what hanging wedges are. It's a pair of wedges that are tied together with a rope or a strap. Yeah, and spe specifically, they're there to keep the uh, the any kind of side bind twisting action of the log to um, exactly too much as you're cutting. So, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> here's here's a loaded question. What do you do if your saw is very, very pinched? <laughs> that's uh that's what you brought your axe for. And uh it may be a while before you get your saw back. But that's uh you know, that's one option that you've got potentially available to you is, is using your axe to to either chop above or below where your where your saw is pinched. Uh, if you've got a really nasty situation, it may not be, uh, you may have to leave your blade in the tree and then go seek help, you know, and get an, another, another saw or another saw team and maybe some, maybe some folks with some more experience uh, that can help you free that saw. Uh, it's a real bummer if you're a long way away from, from any road or access, but that's what you have to do sometimes. And, and Lee asked, since the piece she was cutting was not suspended on both sides why did they cut at an angle yeah very good question so they cut they put that compound cut in there so that whenever the the log fell free uh, they knew that the uh that the log would would fall cleanly to the ground um in a predictable manner so and then uh, thad just makes a comment that uh in their communication with each other they did acknowledge that they checked for knots yes um, and why why would why do you check for knots anybody got an answer in the chat for that
Knots are hard to cut through. Yep, that's it. Grains going everywhere. Yep, they, sl they slow you down and they wear you out. And they're hard on the saw too. Uh, so just best to avoid, yeah. Exactly. Before we move on, just one final question. Can you use a second saw to release release the stuck saw? Uh, depending on the situation, that may be an option. You know, once again, you're gonna have to step away from the situation for a little bit. Uh, and then you want to you want to form a new objective, right? Because you've you've got a new situation, and uh, so you're going to have to run back through Olek again, and you know, size up your hazards, any new hazards, and you've got exposed teeth there. Uh, you know what's what's the potential for that saw to be you know further mauled in a, in the release? Uh, you need to factor in all of that uh, information, and then and then come up with a, a go no go plan. You know is is this a an option for you to to cut through up there with a with a second saw, sure, maybe, um, but in other cases it may not be. Yeah, sometimes your saw will uh, will bind will bind because of side bind, pretty severe bind that your wedges couldn't handle, uh, and a solution could be to just cut another buck out. But you're probably going to run into the exact same bind situation. Yep. Again, yep. and so uh, keeping that in mind, and then and Lee. Was asking again about the reason to strip the bark is to keep the saw sharp, and that that that's correctly. It's it's particularly if that log has been across the trail for a while, it's had a chance to gather debris, um, and uh, that fine particulate matter can actually uh, dull your dull your teeth. So absolutely, yep. All right, I think we can move on, Dave. Okay. So, yeah, good job, everybody. Okay. So being a crosscut sawyer, you know, you've, you've got your knowledge and you've got your skills. And so I just wanted to lay this out and give you something to, to think about. So knowledge, you want to make sure that you understand policy, uh, any safety uh, facets of your job that you're undertaking, uh, specifically as they relate to policy and, and your personal safety. And then uh, if you want to make sure that you know what we look inside and out, uh, make sure you're aware of those human factors that we talked about on day one. And then uh, practice with uh, compression and tension. You really want to form accurate assessments of your of your material uh, before you ever sink a saw into the wood. And then uh, make sure you're you're very well versed with backcountry work practices. Uh, and then on the skill side of the equation, you want to make sure that you're very good at communication. Uh, it's one of those things for some of us that's a little harder to, to practice. Uh, but it's invaluable for, for really good cross-cut dynamics. Uh, transportation, and handling tools, want to make sure that you practice with that. Uh, you're aware of the fact that uh, saws can be very slippery whenever they're, uh, they're covered in oil and, uh, and that you're, you're taking care of them as best as you can because they are, uh, they're old and we need to maintain them as long as possible. So, you know, your, your smooth handling of those materials is, is really really critical. Uh, physical conditioning, this is hard physical labor. And so you really do need to, to uh, give yourself an accurate assessment, you know, and, and, and give yourself uh, the ability to go out and, and train yourself. Uh, you want to stretch, you want to make sure that you've got as much uh, range of motion in, in your, your hips and your knees, and your back. Um, if you get injuries, you may want to uh, Think about how you can address those injuries to, to strengthen those areas. You know, you also want to practice with both hands. There's there's situations where you you absolutely cannot use you know just just your right hand if you're right-handed, and so practicing with with both hands is is a very very good skill to have uh, because then you reduce the overuse injuries that you may acquire, and then and then it gives you more uh, endurance as as you perform work throughout the day, you keep switching back and forth between your hands and, uh, and you'll feel a lot better at the end of the day than if you're just using one hand. Uh, then below that it goes hand in hand with pacing the work. You wanna make sure that you pace the work uh, both for yourself and for your saw partner. Uh, go, as, go as fast as the slowest person and don't, don't try to rush anything. Uh, the tools are such, they're old, you need to take care of them. And, and facing your work appropriately uh, will really help out. Uh, make sure you care for yourself and then also care for your partner. 
Uh, if you notice that, you know, maybe they're kind of down in the dumps for the day or something like that, uh, check on them. Uh, you know, maybe they're maybe they're hurting and they don't want to tell you about it, but uh, it's something that, you know, if they are hurting, then you, you need to stop. Uh, take care of them, take care of yourself, and then uh, get back to your operation when everybody's healing well. Okay, uh, so the last little bit here, and this is inspection, maintenance, and storage. Yeah, I do apologize for having a, a, a chainsaw sawyer in the background. I couldn't figure out how to uh, use this particular slide with, uh, without the chainsaw in the back. But anyway, I want to check your, your blade for straightness. This is really critical. Uh, if, you're, if your blade is bent, it's going to really wear on you trying to use that saw. So make sure it's straight. If it's not straight, you need to take it to a filer that's, that's uh, practiced at, at taking the kinks out. Uh, you want to make sure that your handle is complete and if it's got multiple parts and that it's in good repair. You don't want any splinters or uh, broken wood in the handles. And you also want to make sure that that pin on, on pin handles is, is in good repair too. So that, uh, because as they, as they wear, they get thin and then they bend. And sometimes you, they bend uh, during use to the point that you can't get that pin to, to free itself easily. And you may have to drill from both sides to pop that pin out, which is not fun. So uh, make sure you check that pin. Uh, rake your teeth filed below the cutting teeth. Uh, this is a good thing to check on a saw that's been used a lot. Uh, if your rake your teeth are starting to, to be at the same level as your cutting teeth, the rebound in the wood is going to catch those rakers and you're gonna be fighting those rakers a lot and it's gonna dull your rakers. So if you start noticing that, it needs to go to a filer. Uh, for a sharpening. And you also need consistently set cutting teeth. The, the cutters, if, if one of them gets bent out of alignment, uh, can be a real royal pain. And uh, there are a few techniques that, uh, that you can use to, 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 to reset a tooth in the field. Um, but if you're not very familiar with those techniques, uh, please take it to a filer and, and have them reset that tooth or teeth. Then you want to clean and you want clean and sharp cutting surfaces. Uh, if you're starting to notice nicks or, um, or dull surfaces, uh, probably want to start thinking about uh, taking it to a filer again. And then also for development of rust or pits, uh, those are the you know the the cancer of a uh, of old crosscut saw. So uh, if you're doing good maintenance, uh, those uh, shouldn't show up for you. So daily maintenance, inspect your saw before and after cutting operations. Make sure that it's still in good condition. You want to wipe down the blade and teeth uh, with oil before storage. Uh, and you want to clean the blade and the teeth of any pitch or compacted wood shavings before you wipe down the blade. Uh, that ensures that you're not trapping moisture uh, in cut wood fiber or in the, in the pitch uh, that can then cause uh, rust or rust pockets to, to start to develop in there. And then, uh, yeah, replace those handle pins whenever they get worn out or any other part of the handle for that matter. There are some companies, we talked about the uh, the blades not being made well, other than Curtis. And again, those are junk to use a strong term, um, but there are companies that are uh, making uh, replica handles that work great. Um, they make both the hardware yes. and if you want to, they'll make the actual handle itself out of ash or whatever you want. So uh, yes. if you get a, if you get some handles that are like maybe beyond your ability to repair them, you can um, find some companies that'll make those handles uh, specifically like the Western um, handles. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That is very good information to pass along. Uh, so field storage. Talk a little bit about this. You want to avoid any water or high humidity. Uh, that is that's the curse of a crosscut saw. So, if possible, you want to hang the saw up by its end uh, from a tree or a branch, and you want to make sure that the teeth are secured towards the trunks. That way, if if somebody uh, was walking by, uh, they're not going to accidentally or an animal for that matter, they're not going to accidentally hurt themselves. 
Uh, but that way it's keeping the saw above the ground and, it's, and it stays dry. And that's really what your goal is. If you do have to store it on the ground, you want to build a barrier between the saw and the ground. And, uh, and then also ideally, you know, if you've got a, a large log or something uh, that's dry underneath it, uh, you can store those teeth so that they're pointing towards that log and so they're not, they're not facing out and going to cause a problem. Uh, once again, yeah, if you leave it overnight, you want to make sure you remove those handles and keep them with you. Uh, rodents are greedy and they love to chew those things. So, uh, long term storage, the don'ts. Never store a saw on a metal surface. Direct contact with another saw or leaning against the wall or bent around any pack or other object. Uh, never store a saw in a sheath or with a guard on the blade for long periods. Uh, that induces rust. And then the, particularly the rubber line fire hose is bad because it does hold moisture next to the saw's teeth. And over time, that will become a problem. Uh, the do's, you do want to store in a safe, dry location away from animals and people. If you can uh, build a nice little uh, storage locker uh, with the less hooks at the top or some other fastening up there that you can hook into the, the pinholes, uh, that's a fantastic way to store your saws. And you want to make sure that they're, they're straight, the handles are removed, and ideally you put the teeth facing away from the opening of the locker. We don't accidentally reach in there and catch yourself. And then uh, before you store for a long time, you need to make sure that the blade is, is clean. And then you want to coat it with some sort of heavy oil um, or grease. And I, I heard yesterday in the chat, some folks are using silicone, which I thought was very, very fascinating. And I hadn't heard of it before. So uh, I'll be looking into that myself. But uh, yeah, so typically it's, it's heavy oil or grease. Uh, so just to summarize, you want to use the right saw for the, for the operation you're encountering. You want to practice safe handling. Uh, carefully store and transport saws and your supporting tools. You want to use axes, wedges, underbucks, and other supporting tools to your greatest advantage. Uh, and that's where mentoring comes in. Uh, the more mentors and the more time you get to spend with those tools, the greater efficiencies you'll find. So yeah, gain, gain as much knowledge as you possibly can. And then uh, once again, knowledge and practice are the keys to success in the crosscut world. And you want to make sure that you're taking good care of yourself and your equipment because you are your own motor. So uh, with that, that's all I've got. So we can open it up for general questions now. Yeah, I've asked uh, I've asked in the chat box, but there's some great questions, but the they start to get buried. It helped me out a lot if you really value your question to add it to the Q&A box. Um, and I'll go to that real quick. Uh, John Henderson asked, uh, what are the pros and cons of the M-tooth design? Yeah, so the, the pros of the M-tooth design is that it, it is a very aggressive tooth pattern um, and it will cut quickly. Uh, the cons there is that it does take a lot more force to make that saw move uh, well. So uh, the other pro associated with the M-tooth though is that it, it is very good in hardwood. Uh, so if, you know, if, if you're going to look at buying an M tooth, or if you're lucky enough to find one, um, you know, typically probably the only place you'll be able to use that with any good effect is in hardwoods. Otherwise, you'll, you'll get so stuck that you, you can't move it. Uh, let's see. How do you find um, sharp and clean across the saw? Ooh, yeah. So uh, the gal that you guys saw in the video there is Dolly Chapman, and uh, She's one of the one of the premier folks in the country right now that's sharpening working saws, and uh, I believe she's still in operation. Is that correct, Bill? Yeah, she's still taking saws. I can't remember what her she has a rate per foot that she charges. Um, yes. Yeah, Dolly is still teaching. I would also say uh, many of you all have seen uh, Eric Giebelstein's name during this week. Um, was one of my coworkers at Saws. Uh, at the at the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Skills Institute, there's sort of a rotation of every two or three years of bringing Dolly in to teach, and she has built a pretty um, solid cadre of uh, instructors and or I mean sharpeners um, in in uh, building that army. And so there's folks like Dan Dewicki and Eric would be a good resource of some of the folks that have been uh, under Dolly's tutelage. Um, also check with if you're not 
uh, with the agency, check with your agencies. A lot of times there's some retired, in our case here in the floodhead, Fred Flint, who was a Forest Service employee and for a long time board chair for the foundation. He sharpens our saws. Um, um, and Dolly also might be a resource if she's busy to say she can't, but she could refer to you to a, like a Dan DeWicky who now lives in Michigan and sharpens saws. So sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we do have a we do have a Dolly Chapman graduate up here in the in the Northeast too, and uh, Larry Walter. He's very very good. What's the best way to get pitch off the blade? Yeah, so any of those uh, those citrus citrus based uh, agents uh, can can thin that pitch off your blade. Um, other things that work well, the historic use was uh, the historic material was kerosene. Uh, that does a really good job uh, taking that off. Uh, the other thing that works uh, pretty well, I found out recently, is uh, rubbing alcohol. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any ill effects on the metal. So uh, that's kind of a best of both worlds there, I think. So uh, The question's not there, but uh, if you find a tooth, uh, a saw that's maybe covered in rust, pumice stone is a way to get the, to get the yes. rust off. Um, of course, you'll want to check if that rust has led to pitting, too. Um, and... Um, Gordon has posted in the chat that Dolly actually puts on sharpening classes. You go to, to her in Calpine, California, and, and she teaches. And so uh, tracking down Dolly is maybe become a sharpener yourself. And Nick says, I missed what was said about long-term storage and silicon. Can you elaborate? Yeah, so that was new to me yesterday. Is, uh, I think it was Mountain Hood. Somebody from Mountain Hood posted that they, uh, they've been using silicone to either lubricate and or store their sauce. Uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I'm very interested to look into it myself. So uh, let's see. Yeah. And it looks like uh, best tooth type for changes to make in set or depth, et cetera, for cutting in burn areas. Mostly have lance tooth for soft, large diameter wood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about. So tomorrow we're going to talk more about filing. And uh, we can we can address uh, that question uh, in a lot more detail tomorrow. Yeah, I've got a question too, Dave, along that line. Um, yeah, go for it. When you get to Dolly's level, this is I think is possible. But you know, I have a I have a vintage Simon saw that's never had a set and and uh, put in it, and so you you all oh, wow. cannot imagine how long the teeth are when they come from the fact when they came from the factory <laughs> saws. It's also 100 years old and yet has never seen wood. And shame on me that I haven't um, put it to use yet. But um, once the teeth start getting short, you have to address the gullet, right? And uh, I got to imagine that's a pretty yes. detailed skill of, uh, I'm going to use a Southern term, wallering out the gullet uh, to function. Um, yep. Have you had much yep. experience in that or do you know somebody who's good at doing that? Yeah, so uh, the file that you want to buy for that is that either, uh, well, the one we use is a Great American file. Uh, some of the longer lengths have a have a much larger diameter, so that's a that's a biface file that looks like a, a piece of pie if you look at the end profile of it, and the crust of that pie would be a semicircle uh, that comes back into two flat files that meet in a point, and so that that uh, that rounded edge of that file is a great tool to move those gullets deeper into the blade. So, right. Jerry's got a question about reviewing handle position and when to use each one. Uh, it'd be a little hard to do in virtual, I'm assuming, but can do a make a run at it. It's easier to demonstrate in person. But Yeah, yep. so the handle positioning. So uh, thinking back to the handle types that we discussed there, he had the, the loop handle which sticks up uh, nice and high. And once again, you can't move that one. Uh, but the, the Western style pin handle that we showed, uh, absolutely, you can move that thing in several different positions. and you want to, to move that handle into a position that makes the most sense for the situation you're facing. So if you're cutting close to the ground, uh, one side of that handle is much longer than the other. And so you want to put the longer side up so that you have clearance to, to cut much closer to the ground. Um, and then conversely, you know, if you, if you have to cut high, you can move that, that handle, the longer side of that handle down uh, against, you know, more where the teeth are uh, to give yourself a little bit easier purchase and which then again puts in less less force into the teeth uh, whenever you're you're pushing on the bottom of a of a long handle uh that's in the same plane as the teeth so 
Uh, and then the other the other reasons why you might uh, move the handle around is is for the pressure that you're trying to put into the teeth, uh, depending on how sharp your saw is or how worn out you are at the end of the day. You know, you may change that that orientation uh, to make it easier for yourself to cut. So maybe at the beginning of the day you had your handle up and the longer part up so that you can you can push nice and hard on your teeth. Uh, but towards the end of the day, you, you notice that you're getting tired. And so maybe it's best to flip that saw down or that handle down so that you, uh, you're you not tempted to try and push too hard on that, that long handle above the saw. Uh, the other, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was gonna say the, the D10 also, you know, gives you the chance to um, move that handle to the perpendicular to the, to the blade uh, yep. for clearance issues. Uh, if you're getting close to the ground, uh, and your handle keeps hitting the ground. It keeps hitting the ground. It gives you the option of, of still being able to put some force with uh, without worrying about impacting the ground with your handle with every stroke. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, so you can yeah you can mount it ninety degrees. And whenever you do that, you want to make sure that you're. Uh, I've noticed, at least for me, that it's easiest to run the saw uh, whenever you kind of you make a Vulcan sign with your hand and you put the center of the. Uh, the metal part of the handle that actually makes contact with the saw between your middle and your ring finger and then and pull from that vantage point uh, so that you're not accidentally twisting the saw either right or left uh, you're, you're pulling right down the center of the saw handle uh, by doing that uh, it's, it's not the most comfortable position to, to use in the world but it does work um, earlier in the chat, Tisha had put in the link to the video uh, that Dave used. Um, maybe get her to, she would have a chance to drop that back in there again real quick. So it's um, uh, near the bottom. But um, what I'm seeing with all these questions about storage, someday we need to have either a Dolly or a Dan DeWicky uh, do a video walkthrough of their shop setups. Or Dave, maybe you have one too. Um, I've seen some pretty incredible, innovative ways in which to store. Dan sometimes will have. 60 70 saws in a shop so yes there are still some vintage saws out there but ways to efficiently store those safely store those uh and safely store them for the tool itself to keeping them sharp whether that's hanging or in a series of slots but yeah yeah it's 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 well worth putting in some time and you know and some some thought into the design of your of your storage facility uh, this makes it that much easier to to use your saws so it's, it's no fun whenever you've got a, a place that hasn't been taking care of their saws and they're all just laid up on a shelf and they're all in their sheaths. You got to dig through the pile to get to them and then the, the saws are never straight. And, you know, it's, it's a bad deal. So if you can yeah, put in the time and the thought to make a nice uh, vertical hanging saw rack, uh, it's well worth the effort. Also worth noting, if you come upon a saw that seems perfectly good, but one tooth is broken, uh, one, how far is that tooth from the end versus the middle? Uh, and there are some folks who are fairly adept at welding teeth back on. Um, so don't throw the saw away, I guess is what I'm saying. Don't completely give up on it because there's a broken tooth. Yes. <clears throat> yep. yep. And even uh, if it's got a broken one. tooth. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, so even if it's got a broken tooth, you know, um, it's not the end of the world. Uh, a lot of the time, the saw, as long as there's no burr that's associated with that, that broken area, uh, the saw will still cut fairly well. So, I see no more questions. Um, any final thoughts before we head into our final day tomorrow, Dave or Pete? I think you're still on here, Pete. Yeah, so like I said, tomorrow we'll cover sharpening. Uh, we're just going to hit the high points on sharpening. We're not going to take a deep dive into it, but I do want to make sure that everybody has an understanding of what goes into it. And then, uh, and then after that, we'll be uh, taking questions for uh, the whole class uh, from start to finish here. So, uh, yeah, Bill, if you got any other information to add to that? No, nope. Go ahead, Pete. I'm still here and, and look forward to tomorrow. <laughs>